Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Tracy. I am the marketing manager with ASAP Accounting and Payroll. And today we are going to provide a, an overview, a brief overview of the loan forgiveness, and then we'll also dive into an extensive Q&A. And our agenda today is the um, going over the path to PPP forgiveness. It's actually easier than you might think. Um, how to work with your lender to apply for forgiveness and what to expect for the process. Then our Q&A. And our panelists today are Mark Betts. He's the Senior Vice President for ASAP Accounting and Payroll. Jessica Forgetto, she is the Chief Lending Officer with Citizen State Bank. Alexander Price, Chief Strategy Officer with Citizen State Bank. Brad Tafoya, a CPA and shareholder with Tafoya Barrett and Associates here in Durango. And Steve White is on the call. Um, he's the lead lending relations specialist with the SBA Colorado District Office. And then also joining as panelists, and I apologize, Richard. Richard Betts, our founder and president of ASAP, will be chiming in, as well as um, Doug Price, and your CEO of Citizen State Bank, correct? Ish. Close. Oh, I know it's the parent company. I can't remember the name. Yeah, I'm, I'm chairman of the uh, CSBO Holdings Inc. The, the, Thank you. And Sorry, uh, Brenda Fox, of course, is the CEO of, of the bank. So. Gotcha. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please for the, uh, use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. And only, re only use the chat to let us know if there's some kind of technical issue or audio. Um, Please don't submit questions via chat. Um, please use the Q&A. And you can upvote any of those questions. So rather than um, repeating a question, if you see the one that's already been asked that you want to also ask, just upvote it. And that puts it at the top of our list to answer. Um, we will provide a link to the recording and to the presentation materials um, by tomorrow. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. And also just uh, a reminder too that a lot of the, the resources we're using are the guidance available via the SBA. And a lot of this is based on our interpretation. So let me get into the, the fine print here. Um, so, oh, yeah. so just a, a reminder that this is guidance. It's not legal advice. And uh, so we're, just don't hold us liable. <laughs> And with that, um, I want to turn it over quickly to Steve. So he wanted to share an update on uh, PPP, um, PPP numbers uh, for Colorado. Steve. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Tracy. And thanks to everyone for being on the call. Just real quick about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, or commonly called Idle Advance. And in case you're not aware of that, that program has sunset as of uh, Friday last, so the, the advance has, has gone away. However, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or IDLE itself, the actual loan part, is still around. So you're still um, encouraged to apply for that, consider that as a possible option for your business. Uh, easy enough program to find, go to www.sba.gov or gov, and you'll see the yellow banner at the top, and it'll click you through to the idle loan program. So just let you know, so the idle is still open for business, but the advance itself has sunset. On the, the triple P of the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, that program has been extended until the 8th of August. So uh, lenders on the call, you have until 10 p.m. on uh, August 8th to submit or to, to get your control number for the um, PPP loan submission. Some facts and figures that, that I think the folks on the call would appreciate um, nationwide, and, and these numbers are accurate as of 13 July, uh, we've been able to make 4.9 million PPP loans. So, so thank you to the lenders, especially those on the call, for helping us get that uh, to, to happen. That's, that's an incredible amount of loan uh, volume and traffic for us. The approved dollar amount is over $521 billion. It's billion with, with a B. We've been able to use 5,461 lenders across the nation for this program. I bring up that number just to let you know, on an average um, year when there's no COVID pandemic, the SBA routinely works with right about 
1,800 different lenders across the nation. So we've increased um, our lender relationships triple uh, fold uh, through this program, which is a good thing uh, for, for all the parties in, involved. Uh, lenders who previously were not that super familiar or had become unfamiliar with SBA lending have now learned some of uh, the ins and outs of working with a federal bureaucracy. And uh, we've been able to establish uh, training relationships with, with them as well. But, but the better part is for the borrowers, what that means is lenders near you, local lenders, small lenders, uh, nationwide, statewide, regional size lenders have been participating in this program. Um, interesting fact, uh, of those loans that were made, 3.2 million were made under the amount of $50,000. Um, in the commercial lending world, a loan under $50,000 is considered a microloan. Um, this program was not set up to be a microloan, but I do uh, really like the fact that we were able to accommodate entrepreneurs at nearly every single level. So, so we've done a decent job of filling in the gaps with our PPP program. Uh, here in Colorado, um, there have been over 105,000 triple P loans valued at about $10.4 billion since the inception of the program on April 3rd. The average loan size here in Colorado is right at $100,000, which is comparable to the U.S. national average, which is $106,000. 87% of all the Paycheck Protection Program loans in Colorado were made for $150,000 or less, and just under 95% of the loans in Colorado were under $350,000. And, and I mention that simply to counter some of the things that, that we hear or rather mishear uh, from, from the news, uh, which may or may not be accurate. Sometimes we hear that money is not going uh, to the little guy, quote unquote. Uh, I, I would say the math argues uh, differently. Um, to that end, the triple P program has been responsible for retaining 1.7 million jobs here in the state of Colorado. Uh, now, you may have heard about the, pass, uh, the passing of the Flexibility Act, which has made some changes to the Paycheck Protection uh, Program. And for what, one of the changes I want to discuss is that the loan forgiveness period to fully utilize your funds has been extended from two years to five years. And uh, if you're not able to use um, uh, I'm sorry, the loan, uh, loan, uh, loan forgiveness period to utilize funds is extended from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Apologies. Apologies. If you're not able to use all those funds, the maturity has been extended from two years to five years, still at the 1% rate. Um, the loan payback uh, deferral period has also been extended from six to 10 months. So if you're not able to fully utilize all your funds in the 24 week loan forgiveness program, uh, it will be turned into a loan. That loan has a maturity of five years now at 1%. Now, another change we've, we've made, which, which is going to be a benefit to the borrower, is that we've lowered the requirement of a business owner's loan proceeds being used or spent for payroll costs during the loan forgiveness period from 75% to 60%. So previously, you had to spend 75% on payroll. Um, now you have to spend 60% on payroll. And so that's going to help you better utilize the, the, the funding and to justify your costs in order to apply for the 100% forgiveness. Um, another change that has been made under the Flexibility Act is that we've broadened the safe harbor provisions for calculating full-time employees or FTEs. And some of those, those uh, safe harbors are rather significant. If an employee uh, voluntarily reduces his or her hours, um, and you can document that, that's not gonna be held against you in your calculation. If an employee retires or uh, simply uh, quits uh, working for you, again, document that, it won't be held against you in your calculation. If you've had a required hour reduction um, that was issued by your local or state authorities uh, due to COVID, uh, for example, you, you routinely employed your uh, employee till uh, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, but uh, you are mandated to shut down at 8 p.m. Uh, if you can uh, document that, that you were not able then to meet your normal employees' hours, uh, that won't be held against you in your calculation as well. Employees who were fired for cause or simply refused to come back to work when you extended the offer, if you can document that, 
um, those won't be counted against your uh, full-time employee calculation. So we've done a lot to broaden that safe harbor provision to make sure that it doesn't reflect negatively on the borrower and that we can get you to that 100% if all possible. There are two different forms now. We have the, the standard of the long um, paycheck protection program uh, forgiveness form, and we have the EV paycheck protection uh, forgiveness form. I believe Mark's going to go into that, so I won't steal his thunder, so he can walk you walk you through that. Um, there are a lot of questions about what, so when do I apply for forgiveness? Um, do I use the eight week or the 24 week? So you have up to 24 weeks um, to utilize the funds, but as soon as you reach the point where you uh, know that you can apply for and you have spent uh, 100% uh, for the loan forgiveness. At that time, you would want to submit your application for forgiveness via, easy, uh, via either the easy or the long form. Submit that application to your lender, and your lender will have 60 days to review, to review your file before submitting to SBA. For lenders who are on the call, we are still awaiting guidance from uh, headquarters for the lender methodology to submit the application. They are working at, uh, on that as of now. Um, the, the program will be on an AWS platform that should be compatible with most lender software. We're trying to get ahead of some of the issues uh, that uh, you may have noticed we had, especially with um, repeat of EIN numbers and that sort of thing. So we're making sure that um, those methodologies and pathways are going to be fixed and a little bit more seamless when we roll that piece out. So stand by for that to come out. I, I don't have a timetable for you um, on the call this week that told us that the timing would be soon for the release of that. Um, so however it is, uh, you and they define the word soon, that's what's gonna be rolled out. So that's what I wanted to bring to the table today. I'll stay on the call if there's any questions that, that come my way, whether to get those answered uh, directly here on this call, or we can put them together in an email and send out to be answered um, later. I want to make sure you get the most accurate answer. But again, Tracy and everyone on the panel and everyone on the call, thank you so much for your time. Hang in there. And I really appreciate your patience with us as we work through this. Thank you, Steve. Wow. That was, was a lot. <laughs> so let's get started. And I'll turn it over to Mark. And Yeah, thank you, Steve. That's going to make my... Uh role here a lot easier. I think he touched a bit, touched on quite a few things there. Um, so as we were, we were mentioning earlier, we, we feel like the pathway to forgiveness or to the, the whole process under the changes under the Flexibility Act are going to make things a lot easier. So the biggest hurdle may be just getting started for most people. Once you dive into it, if you can carve out some space, um, then I think uh, it, it should be a, it should should go a lot smoother. So um, I've been having a lot of conversation. Our team's been having a lot of conversations with uh, borrowers, trying to help them understand how to wrap their heads around it. And so I've, we've kind of put this together, this slide together to spend some time on here. And usually the first questions I start with are kind of to help people understand, okay, you can use the easy form if you can answer these questions a certain way. So we start with the salary wage comparison. Did you reduce any employee salary salary or hourly wages by more than 25%? And so we look at that question, if you can get past that question and then move forward. And, and even if you did reduce employees' compensations, uh, you know, cut people's pay by more than 25%, there is a safe harbor that he was alluding to, Steve alluded to there where if you can restore the salary and wage levels by the end of the coverage period, um, that will provide you some relief as well from that comparison um, reduction. Um, if you can get past that question, you can move on to the FTE provision. Um, we're gonna obviously kind of skip over some things we've covered in some prior videos and webinars, and I think Tracy's gonna send out a reference link to some of those more extensive ones that dive into some of these topics just to let everyone know. Anyway, so the FTE provision here, uh, were you impacted by the public health requirements of social distancing? Was you, were you a restaurant? Were you a lodger? Were you even almost in many businesses that were impacted? Uh, did it force you to cut back hours, cut back, uh, you know, in-office staff? Did, uh, did your workload drop because of those health requirements to where you didn't require as many staff at, in general. 
Um, there's a lot of ways of looking at that uh, certification language in the easy application to see if you were impacted by the health requirements. And if so, then that FTE provision really disappears for you and can open some things up. Even if you, if you were not impacted by those public health requirements, did your staffing levels decrease or were you able to meet those FTE comparisons? Um, our business, uh, for instance, was able to meet the same uh, staffing levels. Uh, we were able to flexibly work from home. So in our an accounting firm like ours, we, we didn't have the same impacts per se, uh, but yet we still would be eligible for the FTE provision. Uh, are you able to restore FTE level, even if you, you were not impacted by public health requirements and you could not, you did not keep the staffing requirements, uh, there is a, yet a safe harbor there where similar if you're able to restore the FTE levels by the end of your coverage period or by the end of the year now, um, that you can uh, still qualify as meeting that FTE provision and not subject to the reductions originally drafted. So that's some good news as well. Uh, finally, um, looking at one and two there, salary wage comparisons and FTE provisions, if you feel like you've, you've addressed both, both of those, Keep in mind that that should open things up for allowing you to use the 24 week period, or as Steve said, you know, essentially, a, a, you know, any period in, in between eight or 24 weeks to spend your funds. Um, there is also the alternative payroll coverage period for those that are on a weekly or bi weekly payroll frequency that allows you to simply move uh, the payroll date to make it easier to track. Um, and then there's some language that's been um, that may still come out perhaps um, in some guidance. Maybe Steve knows if there's any guidance coming out on this, but um, there's plenty of CPAs. Uh, there's some Forbes articles and whatnot that have alluded to eligible expenses being incurred or paid. Uh, that, that's, but again, with that 24 week period, if you can, if you can get past the provisions in the FTE provision and the salary wage per, uh, comparison, and then it should open up people to understand that they can use the 24 week period and really make things easier for themselves to skip having to get into prorating uh, or tracking when was it incurred versus paid and all of those things on the gray areas uh, that a lot of people have a lot of questions with related to coverage periods. So if you can slide into the 24 week period, it may be beneficial to look at that as well. Um, in fact, I see more people going that way every day. Mark, um, can, I read, can we can we ask Steve to weigh in on that question? Because it seems to me that it's pretty easy to go to 24 weeks, uh, no matter what, as long as there are no repercussions. Meaning, you know, the biggest, most common question we have is if I spend my money in 10 weeks, not 24, can I apply for forgiveness at the end of 10 weeks? So, so, so let's make sure there is no harm in applying for more than, it's a binary, eight or 24, but if you go 24 and can get forgiveness early, I don't believe there's any harm, but I want Steve to weigh in very specifically on that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, there's no harm in applying for forgiveness as soon as you hit the 100% point, because what they're going to want to do is make sure that you are comparing apples to apples and, and that the FTE and the wage, uh, uh, wages and conversation uh, and the hours were, were all similar or the same based upon the period. So as soon as you meet meet that mark, you're okay to do so. Is there harm to wait till later to make, make sure? No, not, not necessarily. The, the only harm would be is if uh, for whatever reason you think you're at 100 and you're, you're not, and then it goes to a loan. So you've, you, you've increased your uh, accrued interest there a little bit. But on a 1%, I think that would be a negligible mark when we're, we're talking about a couple of weeks here. So if you, if you, for example, it's either eight weeks or 24, but you can apply for forgiveness at eight weeks in one day, for example, is it more liberal yes. simply to 24 weeks and not worry about it? Or is there a benefit to, to, to marking eight weeks uh, under certain circumstances? No, there's no benefit. It's really a borrower's choice at, at this point. As, as long as they hit that initial eight week, eight week point, any time between then and the 24, it, it's really borrower discretion. 
But from a technical standpoint on the EZ form, if we were to look at that, the coverage period for someone anywhere between the 8 and 24 would still technically be a 24-week period on the form itself for borrowers out there looking at that, that, those two fields on the question. You would still list a 24-week period for your coverage period, but essentially in 50, if you have 10, 15 weeks of, of payroll expenses to submit, there you go. Your your 24 week period is still up, but you don't have to maintain your FTE accounts because you were impacted and can certify to that language. Then you don't have to wait for the 24 week period to be over to 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 prove out your FTE requirements. Essentially, correct. Great. So that gets into the you know the biggest thing here is is tracking and documenting your eligible payroll and non-payroll expenses, the last couple of things on here. Um, you know, we've been simply providing a, a few reports we'll show some examples of, um, waiting to see if we need, want to do anything more fancy in terms of payroll, but essentially you're going to bind together um, some payroll reports to support that, what I'm calling, the, it's on the form, the line one payroll costs and the other utility and other non-payroll costs as well. Um, and so we're also suggesting people do it at that point when you're ready, start to do a trial run using the easy PDF two page forgiveness form. And so uh, I say that because I really want everyone to feel comfortable with all the there's a lot of language in there to certify to and check off that you want to understand each of those items um, and, and how to that you're responding to the best of your ability and knowledge there. And as I was alluding to, here is a snapshot from the EZ form. Uh, it's much more simplified than the original 11-page document. Uh, we, you would essentially total up all of your payroll costs in, in your coverage period that you want to put on there. That's your line one. Uh, and then there's lines here for the other non-payroll cost items on here, the rent, the lease payments, mortgage interest payments, utility payments. Um, and so, again, uh, some of these questions that every business is different and unique. We have some different businesses with a lot of transportation costs that fall under utility. Um, so there's a lot of ways of completing this, um, but essentially if you can, as much as you can get in there neatly and cleanly, if you can fall into the 24 week period, that should make this a lot simpler for you to support with documentation. Um, as we were talking about there, so business mortgage interest, uh, rent and lease payments, the rent definition uh, can be has been thrown around as being pretty broad. Again, if you can use the 24 week, then you don't have to dance in the gray areas a little bit with some of these questions on what is a utility, what is not a utility, what is considered rent or not. Even though I, I, we hope that the it, it's relatively clear if you get into it, and we're, we're, that's what we're going to get into in the Q and A, I'm sure. Um, eligible payroll cost. Uh, we've had a lot of questions continuously on this for good reason, um, because essentially, if you remember, there was the you know how am I defining payroll on the front end when I'm making this loan, and how am I defining payroll on the back end? Uh, there was a lot of uh, you know, miscommunication on the front end. And so we're still kind of answering some questions around that. Um, it is the gross before taxes, salary and wages, uh, essentially is the, the main number in there, uh, plus any employer contributions towards uh, health insurance and retirement plans uh, and employer state unemployment payments essentially unless you're in the denver area and you have some local opt type taxes or if you're in another state with some local taxes um, there as well so it's not all taxes in fact it's very few taxes is how i explain it to people it's the gross wages before taxes has been withheld so it's still a higher number it's the gross wages so if someone makes um you know a thousand dollars a week it is uh, the $1,000, it's not the $750 direct deposit they see in their bank account after taxes were taken out. Um, and then again, the employer portion of state unemployment would be the only uh, taxes there uh, from the employer side that are eligible. And, and just also, to, it's important. To, go ahead. One of the questions 
got, Mark, just to be clear, it gets confusing on the taxes because there's only very limited taxes that are eligible. The, the big dogs, FICA and FUDA, the big federal taxes are definitely not eligible, correct? Yeah, and that's why, uh, essentially, I, I would almost say that no payroll taxes are eligible yeah. is one way of looking at it, um, because state unemployment may have already capped out for a lot of employees in the first quarter. Um, so, uh, essentially, you're looking at salary and wages, the, but a lot of people, Doug, is, believe it or not, just don't really go into how their paychecks are calculated, and so they're looking at uh, the net check, the after taxes, as their wages. And that's their, their, you know, after withholding after taxes, uh, net pay, it's the gross before tax amount. So, um, but uh, here's the check register from our software that we use as an example here. And so I'm, I've highlighted the areas that would be included for, for comparison here. So it's the pre-tax gross company totals here on the left. Um, in this example, I've got a little match on there for one employee and then this state unemployment figure. So of all the taxes, we're just really pointing that state UI number there to focus on unless you're in the Denver area or a state with an OPT tax. Um, we have this payroll applicable payroll cost report that I think got cut off on this slide unless it's just me. Um, maybe um, it's just me, but it, it summarizes those things, and we've been including that since uh, pretty much since the inception of PPP uh, started. But we can we're planning on essentially packaging all of these together for clients to help uh, support their line one payroll costs more easily, um, uh, and for all the different payrolls in their coverage period to kind of bundle it together as a packet to support line one payroll cost. Um, and the only thing that to, to point out is the um, the hundred thousand dollar cap. If you have employees that are on an annualized basis over a hundred thousand, there there will be a little bit more math there for you to to make sure that you're not over reporting that number. Um, but if most of, if all of your employees are um, under that level, then it should be pr really straightforward then uh, at that point. Um, the other thing to keep in mind that we were talking about and Brad and I have gone back and forth on emails about is the incurred versus um, incurred versus uh, paid uh, areas. And I don't know if Steve has anything to add there. Uh, there's uh, if you were going to be more conservative, you would want it to be both paid and incurred that you're reporting. And again, if you have 24 weeks to choose from, you should have, uh, a lot to choose choose from essentially, uh, but if you need to, to squeeze in, there's some questions there. Do you have to prorate those or not prorate those payrolls that have certain uh, work days, pay period days that fell uh, within the payroll, but yet the payroll was paid within the coverage period, and or vice versa at the end of the period. So those are the only kind of gray sticky areas that would require additional kind of uh, uh, work to do, calculations to do. Um, depending on what the SBA and Treasury view on that paid incurred. Um, there was that Forbes article from Tony up there in Aspen, um, who, um, it, based on his reading, it, it, it would seem you could do both. So the, the way we're looking at it uh, on the SBA side is we realize that the coverage period is probably not going to exactly match day for day. Um, the actual payroll um, expenses, nor is it going to match um, day for day the um, non-payroll expenses. So what we're saying is, I obviously include what was uh, paid during uh, during the covered period, but if it was incurred as well, and so you, you're going to have some days at, at the front that you're going to miss, and, and some days uh, at the end that, that won't be covered. So you can't you, you can't do incurred at the beginning and the end. So you you look at one or the other and you stick with it uh, consistently throughout. So that, that way you in effect prorate what the expenses are and you get included a hundred percent of the, those amounts. Does that help? It does. So that's how y'all are looking at it over there. So in, in that case, mm -hmm. you know, that just points to the 24 week in my mind, if I was talking to an advising a client, I would really have them focus on, the eight weeks plus essentially just to make sure that there's no 
uh, issues or of getting to that 60% threshold and getting to that uh, full forgiveness level. So um, that, that points to, you know, this is a loan you don't want to come back to get bitten on. So uh, if possible, try to, um, you know, get as many paid and incurred and you're probably going to have more options under a 24 week period than you would an eight week period. Um, and then finally, before I pass it over to Jessica, um, can you use the EZ form? This is essentially the questions that um, you can to, that's on the instructions and I'm try to simplify it, simplify it here for everyone. So for those that are self-employed, this would be someone with really no employees, so um, not a payroll client of ours, but we could have some bookkeeping clients and definitely some clients of, of both the, the bank and Brad's. Um, you know, if you're self-employed, a sole proprietor with no employees, you should be able to use the EZ form. Or um, another, the second option is you did not reduce any of your salaries or hourly pay by 25% or more, uh, as we alluded to as a requirement, and you did not reduce your FTE count. Um, you can use the, you know, one way or the other. Um, there's some safe harbor exemptions in there uh, on that FT count to be aware of as well, getting into uh, employees that you uh, could not get to return to work and those kind of uh, scenarios to keep in mind there. And then finally, this gets into the same salary wage reduction did not occur, plus uh, your business was limited during the coverage period due to compliance with the public health orders. Um, I don't know if Steve, you want to expand on that public health orders and what the SBA is, is uh, how they view that, uh, because that 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 can be construed a lot of different ways, or, or if you feel like the way we've addressed it so far is a good example. Yes. So one, uh, I think the easier example of it would be, for example, uh, restaurants that are typically um, uh, their standard uh, customer hours would conclude at 9 p.m. at night. And so the employees would be paid probably through 9.30 or, or 10 o'clock as they uh, close up, uh, uh, run the cash register till, clean the kitchen, and and um, close up the restaurant and that sort of thing. Um, but during COVID uh, operating, of course, um, the, a lot of uh, areas have mandated that a restaurant be closed at, at 8 p.m. So that would preclude, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, one or two hours of normal employee um wage hours that that you would have them on the books for so so if you can show that due to uh mandate of local or state authority on, on the closing of your establishment you're not able to offer those same hours as um the period you were using as a basis for your application that would suffice and the forgiveness for your fte count yeah and so basically you're just uh, in the documentation for that the, the the borrower just needs to draft some statement that explains how they were impacted. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it'd be easy enough to, to, to throw in that sentence. I, I was unable to provide uh, the normal operating hours for my employees due to the following mandate, and then literally cut and uh, cut and paste uh, that mandate mm -hmm. um, into the the email there. Yeah. Yeah. Another impact would be you know your restaurant and they you cannot have as many tables as before. So you don't need as many, you know, uh, waiters or staff to run the restaurant because you're essentially your restaurant got cut in half or something, I'm assuming, or uh, you're in the lodging business and your hotel or your short-term rental business couldn't uh, operate at the same levels as prior because of, uh, you know, the requirements to reduce lodging, you know, so you're, you didn't need all those employees, I'm assuming would be another one or, or is that correct? Precisely. Yeah. So there's a lot of ways of looking at that. Um, don't just get pigeonholed in the examples we're giving you. Um, but, you know, start thinking about that and how you would uh, document and draft that. Uh, I don't recall if that's a requirement to supply that document to the lenders. Uh, we'll get into that with Jessica here on the next slide. Uh, but also just keep in mind, uh, if you did reduce salary wages or FTEs um, and you don't have that exemption because of the public health orders, you can still use the EZ form if 
you uh, take advantage of the safe harbor by restoring uh, any of those reductions or those staffing levels by the end of your coverage period. Hey, hi everyone. Um, so the first piece, just going back to everything that Mark and Steve have talked about, first piece is really not to rush. So there's really no benefit to submitting your application today to your lender. First of all, your lender is going to reach out to you when they're ready to accept applications. So the majority of lenders, um, depending if they had a manual or an automated process going into this, um, are potentially still updating their system um, to be prepared for um, this forgiveness process. So also, we're still waiting on guidance from the SBA on how we will actually obtain that forgiveness for you. Uh, I think Steve mentioned that that is coming soon and their platform that they're working on. But we are unclear even if that was going to be through a system called the eTran system, which is where we attained your original approval through, or if that would be, for example, through the Colson system. Um, that's another reporting system that we have to use for the SBA. So we're still awaiting that guidance. So really, there's, once again, there's no benefit um, to submitting today. So you don't need to feel rushed or panicked about getting that into your lender they should reach out to you when they're ready to accept applications for forgiveness. Uh, when you are ready to submit your application for forgiveness, uh, things that you should keep in mind is max, uh, make sure you maximize the use of your PPP funds, uh, that you also have supporting documentation and that you feel comfortable about that documentation and your um, certifications that you're making in that. So as far as your forgiveness timeline, once uh, the lenders are ready. They have 60 days to review your forgiveness application and issue a decision based upon that. Um, you do have the ability to appeal that decision. So you, if the lender denies your forgiveness, you technically, as the borrower, have 30 days. Um, so you do that by contacting your lender, um, and you can request an SBA review. Uh, in addition, um, so the traditional loan terms for the SBA um, PPP loans was a 1% interest rate. Um, if your loan was issued prior to June 5th, you have a two-year maturity date. Um, if your loan was issued after June 5th, you have a five-year maturity date. Um, the payment is deferred until the forgiveness amount has been determined. Previously, um, that was six months, but because that window has been extended, um, your payment is now deferred until the forgiveness amount is determined. Uh, and interest does start accruing from when the loan was dispersed, um, but that interest, um, if your loan is forgiven, that interest would be forgiven as well. I think one of the questions earlier may have been answered was, can you extend, if you obtained your loan before June 5th, can you still extend to the five year if, for example, part of your loan is not forgiven? Um, that's definitely a conversation that you'd need to have with your lender. Um, it is, it is a possibility that you and your lender can reach that agreement. As far as documentation, um, just simply, you need to think about the documents that you provided going into this. So when you first submitted your application. So you're still going to need a payroll tax form, such as, for example, your 940 or your 941, and other detailed payroll information. Uh, potentially your bank statements or canceled checks uh, payment receipts. So, for example, if you've paid your utility bill, think about providing a copy of that utility bill and then also your bank statement or a copy of that canceled check where you can prove that that money was paid, including the same for health insurance or retirement. So, your health insurance invoice for your company uh, where you've paid for that, uh, also same for retirement um, or mortgage insurance, lease payments, all of those items. I think noting on the certifications or items that Mark was talking about, maybe that additional information, um, I think this is in reference to slide 11. It just talks about more information that you do not need to necessarily provide to your lender uh, right away, but you need to have prepared in case they ask questions. So going back to um, if COVID was preventing you from having your restaurant open until 9 and you had a reduction in hours or supporting information maybe on why you've reduced your um, FTEs. Those are all things that you should definitely keep good record of. 
and be prepared to provide to your lender if asked. I think I'll turn it back over to, are we going back to Mark, Tracy? Yep, well, now we're gonna open up to everybody. Um, okay. Now it's the, the Q&A portion and you know, we can stay as long as you know, people want to keep asking questions or are available and want to stay on the call. Um, we have a few submitted just so far during the webinar, and then we had several that were pre-submitted, um, which I think some of them were answered, but we can address some that weren't. And, um, hey, and just Tracy? a reminder, pardon me? Oh, this is Brad. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I so uh, let's start. Um, gee, where should we start? Well, Tracy, uh, I saw one of the questions and I wanted to expand on what Jessica said about not being in a rush. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody said that they heard that there was a potential new law out there and, and there is. So there is the Paycheck Protection Small, Be Small Business Forgiveness Act that um, was submitted and is in the Senate. I'm looking at it right now. That was read twice and referred to the Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Um, so that is in process. And what that Small Business Forgiveness Act would do is basically if somebody has a loan that is uh, 150000 or less, it would make the process even more simple by having a one-page form where they attest to uh, all the PPP rules. So that's the potential. It is a bipartisan bill. So there's a potential that that could pass. And, you know, something, especially for those small um, loans that people want to wait on, uh, because that would certainly simplify the process. And I think the lenders would also appreciate that for some of these small loans. So again, no, no reason to be in a rush with this stuff because these, these uh, rules are continuing to evolve. Brad, uh, this yes, is thank you, Brad. Uh, Jessica, I'd just like to add on to what Brad said. It's one of the few things in, in the world that, uh, like wine, it gets better with age. And uh, Brad is correct. 85% of the loans made in the United States are under $150,000. And so I, I think it is a bipartisan, as Brad pointed out, and it's very likely this will get passed and that will alleviate a lot of paperwork for 85% of all the loans that were made and probably 85% of the people that are on the, this call today. So wait if you can. And, and, and the other thing that gets better with age is a rural Southern accent, uh, Mark. So that gets better with age too. Uh, yeah. I do think that one of the things that we all need to remember is that the rules for forgiveness, and Steve, we're gonna round back to you you know, the rules for forgiveness are not promulgated yet. So again, that, that, that's the key thing about patients is that there is no uh, uh, rule yet. Steve, can you talk to us uh, about your best judgment on timeline uh, when we, we might see that? Or are you guys sort of waiting to see if this $150,000 forgiveness rule passes before you uh, jump in? That's, so I'm speaking uh, from a speculation uh, standpoint, so, so please, uh, no one quote me. This is, this is just uh, Steve's best guess, and, and my best guess is, is that you're right on the money, that they're probably waiting for that and other measures to see if they're going to be passed before they roll something out just to have to, to reel it back in sort of thing. Um, I, I do know, too, that they were discussing putting it on an AWS-type uh, platform, and they were looking at grabbing uh, the different um, vendor software that, that's traditionally used by many uh, commercial lenders across the nation to, to, to make sure that we wouldn't have the same bugs and kinks that were uh, in the, the first rollout. So they're trying to get um, through all, all of that as well. So because of that, yeah, we just don't have uh, a timeline as to when they're going to issue the lender side uh, for for getting with. so I, I would just echo your sentiment that that takes uh honestly it takes the stress out and, and the worry of having to get that 
um, forgiveness in now. It's, it's just not, not the case. So, yeah, ho hopefully um, they'll define uh, what soon is uh, here shortly. So, so we'll uh, be able to look forward to that and you can uh, better take care of your customers and, and manage expectations. But, but right now it's just a waiting game. And, and I would surmise a lot of it has to do with whether or not um, that particular bill uh, and other measures are going to move through the Congress. Great. Well, um, how do we want to begin with the Q and A's, guys? I think there's been a lot of questions about sole proprietors and owner employee empo owner employee pay, and I'm wondering if we want to um, address that as that one keeps coming up. I do have a slide that outlines. Um, the various um, compensation <laughs> rules here. So I don't know. Well, so yes, uh, owner compensation is is eligible to be counted towards the forgiveness. Um, and what am I missing here? So uh, it, if it it's if the owner's compensation is over a hundred thousand then it's capped at a prorated basis um if it's an eight week coverage period it would be capped at uh 15385 is that correct and um if a 24 week it'd be more 20,833 um correct uh if you're using the long form i see some questions from one of the uh, uh attendees uh, that's getting into the schedule a which I believe is on the 11 page form. It's not on the EZ form. I would first of all ask you to make sure you don't qualify for the EZ form because you really want to use the EZ form and stay away from that uh, longer schedule, uh, 11 page if possible. But regardless, um, the Schedule A calculation, you would essentially cap um, that owner's pay. And on the Schedule A, it is on a different. Uh, uh, I'm not looking at it currently, but I believe owners would be uh, calculated similar to the Schedule A, but they would be entered on a different area of that longer 11-page form. I can't recall exactly, but I think that's how it works. Um, okay. Um, before we get too far out, um, with that, the PPP small business forgiveness bill um do we know has that is that out of the house and into the senate just to confirm no it's still in the senate it's still in the senate okay yeah i think it's got a ways to go still so um we'll keep an eye on it and obviously it'll be broadcasted through our if you're not subscribed to our email newsletter already um you know we will blast that out if you're an asap client as i'm sure uh a lot of people will i'm sure the bank or brad would as well on their stuff. Um, just Mark, to, yeah, Mark, just to emphasize that right now, Congress is in recess and they, uh, all the senators are back visiting their states and electioneering. They'll probably be back in session, I believe, August 11th. So uh, between now and 11th, nothing's going to, uh, you're not going to hear anything. Okay. But so your smaller loans, you, you, that gets into the waiting. Um, uh, I know a lot of people want this all off their plate is kind of the urgency there as well. So, um, you know, use your best abilities if you feel confident with your, what you got before then. So um, let's see here. I just want to jump into some of these Q and A's. Um, man, that first one looks lovely. Um, Oh. Tracy, anybody want to moderate and just pick one of these and read them off to the, the panel? And, oh, sorry. Um, um, yeah, let's start at, right at the beginning. Um, as the hospitality industry has never fully reopened, eight-week loan for May is about to be used up. Is there any indication for a second loan to help employees or businesses to carry them until they are able to open? Or are they out of options? So from our standpoint, we, the products we have on the table now, we, we have the Paycheck Protection Program, 
Uh, separate from that and, and distinct is through the Office of Disaster Assistance, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, or, or the EIDL. Um, there's also a, a Main Street program offered by the Federal Reserve and just rolled out today, hot off the process, so I'm, I'm still absorbing information on it, is something called a Community Advantage uh, Recovery Loan. Uh, right now that is offered through two institutions who are running that pilot here in Colorado. Uh, one of those is Colorado Enterprise Fund, and the other one is the Colorado Lending Source. Uh, so those are CDFI organizations, uh, nonprofits who have been selected, um, not not by me, but by SBA headquarters to uh, run those programs. Th those programs are going to be similar in nature to a standard 7A loan, but they're expressly for uh, the the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response uh, financially. So that, that's another potential loan product. Uh, I apologize. I, I, I don't have a lot of information on that product other than knowing it's, it's just rolled out literally uh, today on um, 16 July. But but those are the options that, that, that I see on um, from the federal side. Uh, however, I, I am aware that through the Office of Economic Development at the state level, at, at the state of Colorado, there are some state programs. And, and I would hazard to, to guess that, that many counties and municipalities also have, have some programs to, as well. Yeah, Steve, let me, let me address that if I'm not muted. Uh, this is Doug Prey. Uh, I, I, I am on what may end up being appointed to the governance board of what's called the Climber Fund. Uh, the Climber Fund will be a, a, a subsidized uh, low interest loan program uh, specifically targeted for uh, proportionally to communities throughout the state. Uh, and a lot of the design of it was to uh, consider hospitality industry that may have uh, n negative earnings or downturns in earnings as a product of the COVID-19 situation, but have a historically good situation. So if you'll, Steve, if you'll share with me uh, the information on the new programs with you, I will reverse that and share it to you and to the folks at ASAP. And maybe the next time we have a, a webinar, we can address those and idle as a separate topic uh, because everybody that's part of this group has a vested interest in the recovery from the, uh, the downturn that occurred as a result of the, the shutdown. Absolutely, will do. Now, to the question, I, I know from a legislation standpoint, there's a lot of acts that have been proposed to extend PPP, uh, but there's no telling how much traction they'll get between now and Election Day. Uh, I know that uh, our senator here, Michael Bennett, uh, signed on with, uh, I think, a senator from Indiana or somewhere in the Midwest just recently with a, another program designed specifically for um, restaurants. Uh, it would be a little different than the PPP, but very similar in terms of nature from what I read of it. Again, but these are just proposals at this stage. Um, whether the, anything gets done between now and election day, there's no telling. Um, but um, hopefully, there's it'll hopefully there's some targeted programs out there on the next round that, that you probably have to substantiate some of your business losses to qualify for or something like that. But um, but I would just keep keep in contact with uh, with us, and we will certainly announce them if there is anything that comes out. Yep. Hey, Mark, I think what you're referring to is the uh, is the Restart Act that uh, Senator Bennett has put out. And there is a companion bill in the House that I see. Uh, the Restart Bill does, again, appear to be bipartisan. It was introduced in May. So, you know, the unfortunate thing is these things all take a lot of time. But uh, if somebody is interested, they should definitely look up that Restart Act and, uh, you know, contact the appropriate people to make their voice heard about yeah. that. Thank you. All right. And speaking of EIDL, <clears throat> uh, just uh, someone was asking with the grant, is the grant deducted from PPP forgiveness amount just like the ID, EIDL loan would be? Well, I think it's actually the reverse of that. I think the grant is definitely subtracted from the um, PPP loan. Uh, the loan, the idle loan is just a loan. It's a loan and there is no forgiveness on that. 
Right. And, but the advance amount you will put on your um, application, that amount would be reduced, uh, re removed from your forgiveness amount. Let, it, it will, let, let me jump in because we've, um, unfortunately, uh, SBA has kind of muddied the waters on this one slightly. Yes, uh, uh, the, the advance, the idle advance will be subtracted from the PPP for forgiveness portion. It, exactly how that mechanism is going to work, we're still working out on our end. Um, I, I'm making a, an assumption uh, which we all know how dangerous that is, that that's going to be part of the lender side of the forgiveness uh, application. But right now, just, just know that that's what, what we've been told is that the advance uh, that you received will be subtracted from the forgiveness um, eligibility amount. Now, the, the idle itself, um, if, if an idle was made before January 31st or if it was made after April 3rd, um, it won't be included. It shouldn't be included on the, the PPP re refinance unless it was used for um, payroll specifically. Um, if the idol was used for payroll, then it should be refinanced with uh, the PPP program. That's the way it's supposed um, to work. So that's uh, hopefully that, that clarifies a, a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Steve, this is Richard Betts. I, I, I would like you to just clarify something. You may have done it previously, but uh, we talked about restaurants and restaurants being impacted by government fiat in terms of number of hours and or seating capacity. And I understand that, but to draw a parallel, let's, let's say that I'm a purveyor to a restaurant. And so I'm, I'm uh, raising onions and I'm selling onions to a restaurant. Well, I'm dramatically impacted, although not directly impacted. Uh, I would think that uh, a, a food producer like that could very well say and certify that they've been impacted by the government. Would you agree with, to that? Yeah, so yes and no. We're, uh, we're, would a, a purveyor to or an indirect uh, uh, or ancillary business be, be adverse effect, uh, affected? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's, that would be your justification for uh, applying for the IDLE or applying for the PPP in the first place. Um, could, could a business owner of that ancillary uh, business use uh, that relationship um, to, uh, as, par as part of their safe harbor? No, no they could not. one is about eligible payroll costs. Can you include any vacation payouts from employees who are terminated? Yes, this is how um, we're including that. So. But I think what they're referring to is, you know, the payout of vacation balances because yes. you're required to pay that out any accrued vacation. But again, the answer is yes. Um, I need to pull up a form to answer that one. Um, uh, uh, the FTE reduction, let me just kind of go over that. You have that slide in your, mm -hmm. do you want to cover that? Um, we can cover that real quick. But essentially there's a, there's a period of time um, to look at your original baseline FTE number, that's your target FTE number to you're trying to achieve and it's, uh, we can get into the mathematics of uh, anybody that's a 40 hour a work week is counted as one full time employee. Um, part time employees, you have, you have two ways of making that calculation, and this is spelled out in the longer 11 page form and instructions. But the simplified manner is anybody less than 40 you can count as a half, a 0.5. Uh, or you can do another mathematical calculation to, if it works out in your favor better, you can do, use another one. And I think we have examples of those on our website, Tracy, you've worked so hard on, on our help center on these um, over the last three months um, to share with people if need be. But the question is really getting into how, do you, how does that FTE work and the safe harbor measures there. Um, I need to pull up, what is Safe Harbor 1? Um, 
That's a good question. Safe Harbor One, exempt from FTE requirement if you document. Yes, so Safe Harbor One here listed, if you were impacted by, um, again, these are the public health requirements and you were not able to retain that employee uh, because of that, then that would qualify you for the Safe Harbor One measure, uh, getting to, to the question here. Um, from the from the borrower in, in reading the safe harbor, I believe my answer is yes. Um, and it wouldn't it, none of this for, uh, would would impact your eligibility for forgiveness. It would even if uh, I, the proper term would be you would have a, a reduction in your forgiveness eligibility. So just the, you wouldn't get full. But in your case, it, I, I don't want to confuse you. Um, if you qualify for the safe harbor one, then. Uh, you would you would still be on track for full forgiveness there, and so you could skip the FTE requirements because you could certify that on the EZ form that you were impacted by the government uh, requirements uh, to help slow the spread of the virus, and therefore uh, you wouldn't have to do any FTE calculations. Um, uh, the next question um, is about if I consume all my PPP funds on a certain date. Uh, what is the date I use to determine my FTE level? Uh, Steve, this is the question that I, I think they're asking here is that um, they're, they're, they would like to use the 24 week coverage period, but they're gonna exhaust their funds uh, in week 10 or 12, for example. Do they have to, sh do they have to supply or certify that they met FTE requirements for the full 24 weeks or just until the funds were exhausted? It, just until the, the funds were exhausted and then they would check the box uh, saying 24 weeks on the, on, on the easy app. Okay. Um, that's good news. Um, And then let's see here, Eleanor's asking about uh, the Schedule A cash compensation column. That is gross wages. Cash compensation is a, is a, is, would be the gross wages for each employee to be listed there on the Schedule A. Anybody have any, Brad, did you want to follow up on that 24-week that uh, question before we skip over that? I just saw your face there on that, so. Well, I, I, uh, um... Yeah, let me see if I can find it. I guess I, I've got a little bit of a concern. I, I've seen a Q&A on an AICPA website that I guess gives me a little pause for, uh, um, let me see if I can find it again here. Yeah, so on, on the American Institute of CPAs website, and I, I'm trying to just understand what this means. And so maybe Steve can help us here, but it says, if a borrower applies for forgiveness before the end of the covered period, how is the salary reduction calculated for forgiveness purposes? And, and what their answer is, and I think I've also seen this somewhere else, uh, maybe uh, on the treasury site, but it says if the borrower applies for forgiveness before the end of the covered period and has reduced any employee's salary or wages in excess of 25%, the borrower must account for the excess salary reduction for the full eight week or 24 week covered period. So my concern is, is that if they go past the eight week period, say we're into 10 weeks, um, and then they reduce salaries for somebody by more than 25% after that, does that count against them for that full 24 week period? And does it then force them to use the eight week period? That, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer for that. Uh, we, we've pushed that back up because we we've, uh, we we were wondering that even before the the 24 week extension happened. You know, once the borrower applied, because um, uh, they clearly the the lender has 60 days to review, and once you're reviewing it, if the borrower's business um, compensation and wages uh, hours change, would that reflect? Um, negatively on what they had said their forgiveness status was. So we're still awaiting an answer for that. But to the FTE requirements, which was the question from the, from the um, audience, um, was 
you, you don't have to, because a lot of people, once the money's gone, they can't maintain the staffing levels. It's a concern out there that the PPP money was a, was a uh, lifeline for them and um, helpful. But when the money's gone, they, some of these employees, they, they just got to get real thin again, unfortunately. Um, and so if it runs out in 12 weeks, uh, they don't have to support the FTEs for the full 24 weeks. Uh, regardless of the salary wage comparison was the original framing of the question. And Steve is, and I think you answered, it would be through the 12, the period they exhausted the funds. Right. That's why I, I'm inclined to think it's going to be towards the borrower's benefit to submit once they have that hundred percent. Um, Cause I don't believe SBA is going to hold them responsible for um, actions, uh, payroll or HR actions taken after the um application is is submitted um so the 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 business owner should then at that point be free to increase uh reduce or maintain hours um in accordance with uh market conditions that that make sense to run the the business um but again like i said we we've pushed up for a, a more detailed answer on that and and so far we're we're still waiting sorry jessica that's not what you wanted to hear <laughs> We did have a pre-submitted question too regarding um, someone who was out on medical. And um, let me read the question. And I, I, I'm assuming that this would be an FTE exemption, but I wanted to get your take. They have an employee who was out on medical leave and did not get paid. Um, she's back now and being paid the same amount. She did apply for a few weeks disability with California when she was out. Is there anything special that the employer needs to do to account for her? Um, they have the medical records and doctor's recommendations um, to support that kind of in and out with the FTE, that level. That's, that's a good question. Let me add that to, to my list. Um, okay. I, I hate to have, have hazard a guess, but let me, let me ask that one. Okay. And I'll, I'll get back with you when I get a, uh, an answer. Okay. And um, I'll be sure that I get this that answer back right back to the person who asked it, since it was specific to their situation. Well, I, it, if I were to guess at that one, Tracy, it would, you know, that employee because they requested leave is essentially uh, similar to the safe harbor provision that says this employee refused to return to work. I mean, they refused for a reason, uh, you know, so they shouldn't be held against the FTE calculation. If I were to justify that am i reading that am i hearing that question correctly tracy do you follow my logic yes and i think too with they have the extended period because uh, she is back um so i think too that might um just make that moot to begin with um because she left and she's back so that that to is level hasn't changed um but, but essentially, well, let's say you had an employee that refused to return to work mm -hmm. uh, because of a conflict for one week or something, or um, or like in this case, because of a medical leave issue. But then they would later, I, I think that alone would then just, on the longer FTE calculation, you would just exclude them from from the impact of the of the FTE in the first place because of that. If they worked for you in, in the past, they were going to work for you during the coverage period, but at one point during that coverage period, they, they could not come to work for you. And essentially at that point when they refused to work for whatever reason, this happens to be a medical reason that then that would then put them in the, uh, under one of those safe Harbor provisions um, spelled out. That's my assumption too. Um, also, one of the other pre-submitted questions, um, this one's come up before, but now that if, since we have Steve on the call, maybe he could shed some additional light. Um, has the SBA discussed company rent payments made to an entity with the same ownership as the company? So I, I, if, if it's the case of, for probably the, the greatest example would be an operating company making rent slash uh, lease uh, payments to uh, an, an eligible passive company. If that were in place before 
uh, February 15th, and so that was a normal expense. Yeah, absolutely. So that would fall under the non, non, non-payroll expense el- eligibilities um, right there. Um, just make sure that's not something new um, right. that, that happened uh, after that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And then let's go back to the, the Q&A, the live Q&A. If you apply for forgiveness before the 24 weeks is up and you are only partially approved, can you add more weeks and reapply for total forgiveness? I think you just wait. <laughs> yeah, I think Jessica had a, if she or Alexander I, are still on the call. Yeah, go ahead. I I really wouldn't apply until I had used all my money. So I was kind of confused about the question. So what if someone- Well, had- I could see them saying that they had a, they were partially approved. I don't know, partial approval. I don't, is there a partial approval? You can be par- get partial forgiveness. Yes. Yeah, you can. Uh, partial forgiveness, but, if they but, the appro- but your approval is either oh, approved approval. or not approved, right? right? I think they interpreted it as if they only received partial forgiveness, could they reapply with a – that's how I interpret it. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, if you've used all of the money and you've met the 60%, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't apply until I had used 60% on payroll. I was and to yeah. clarify for Confused. people too, um, you know, that 60% is just a, it's a minimum threshold for full forgiveness, um, 60% spend on payroll costs. You can spend up to 100% on payroll costs um, to get uh, Correct. Forgiveness. So I think that's um, tripping some people up still. I think maybe part of his, his question as well is, um, if, if say he spent the money, right. And it finished July 15th, but he doesn't get back to full FTE until September. Mm. Maybe that's, maybe that's more of the question. Mm-hmm. Uh, because then he would have had, he would have technically spent all the money, but he hadn't gotten back to the regular staffing levels, mm-hmm. uh, that, that he was expecting. And so the initial application, let's say in July, doesn't have the FTEs required if he builds up to with, it, within a relevant time frame. Let's say they had originally applied for an eight-week time frame and had extended it to 24 weeks. Could he? Could they then reapply? My understanding is no. Uh, but maybe Steve or Jessica, you might have better insight there. Yeah, cur- currently, I mean, as it stands uh, on 16 July, we, we don't have a mechanism uh, for that. So, yeah, my advice would uh, be uh, to wait until you're able to get that, that manning requirement. So that way it puts you in, in the clear. Yeah, you want to build some cushion in for your – you want to make sure you're ready to go and apply once. You don't want to go back and forth. I mean, um Let's see if we can get through some of these questions. Um, owner compensation is included towards eligible payroll costs. That's correct. The long form, it, it's included on line nine um, rather than with the other employees on the Schedule A. But in the simple form, it would be just all included under line one up to the $100,000 limit prorated for eight or 24 weeks. Um. Someone's asking about, can we pay retirement contributions for the whole year in the eight or 24 week period and count that for PPP forgiveness? That's a Steve answer, I bet. It seems to me that logic tells you that it's the entire, the retirement contributions for the payroll period covered, but Steve, will you address that? You can't do prepaids on rent and other things. The retirement is something we haven't specifically answered. So Steve White, let's throw it to you. Right. Yeah, you'd want to prorate it for the, the the covered pay period only, not not for the entire year. Thank you. So yeah. just to expand on that a little bit, um, there are some different 401k types. Um, you know, crew, uh, I'm not. Maybe Brad has more depth knowledge on that. But you know, where the they only pay the safe harbor types or profit sharing types, where the the employer's usually only making a contribution once a year. Um, and so we've been instructing clients to make those contributions prorated, like you're saying, Doug, 
uh, for the payroll period ahead of time uh, and essentially contact your 401k third party admins to find out how to just to make sure but it you know you're going to make essentially two payments this year one during your coverage period and then another normally at the end of the year how you normally would make that yeah and I, but I for think, a lot of yeah, go ahead right well i think the reminder for everybody is you know the secret to real estate is location 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 uh the secret to safe harbor or other provisions is documentation, documentation, documentation. So, so that, you know, I think Steve talked about uh, those critical elements. Just make sure that anything you do is, is clearly stated and logical. I, I think that we'll, as we field uh, questions for reimbursement, uh, most people are going to make uh, their own, uh, um, uh, you, you know, make their own statement or swear to their own uh, statement. But our logic is going to say if it's a qualified expense it's prorated for that period we're likely to accept it and i don't see steve calling us and saying hey you didn't do this right or it was wrong if you if you have a ten thousand a twelve thousand dollar retirement contribution for a year you're covering eight weeks of payroll or two months of payroll and you do two thousand dollars of the twelve thousand that's going to seem a logical thing to do anything outside of that proportional view will seem illogical and we'll probably look at that. And Jess, you can, you can address that or Steve, you can address that. But I, but I think we're gonna try to be logical and commonsensical, which sometimes doesn't work in regulated environments, but we're gonna to look to your own documentation and justification to do it. Steve, you comment? Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, make sure you can, uh... As long as you can document why you did what you did, you're, you're going to be safe. This is not a, a gotcha program. This is a, a help the borrower, help the business owner, help the entrepreneur, help the employee uh, stay paid uh, during the pandemic. That, that's the I, idea. So what we're looking to do is make sure that uh, the borrower used the, the funds in an eligible manner. And as long as you can document uh, what, what you did um, and, and how and why you did it, you're, you're going to be fine. Uh, the, 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 the second, uh, let, let's answer the question again on common sense. The, the employee who makes over 100000 again, I think the issue is to make sure you maintain the proportional uh, payment. So that, that you don't get a pay, a, if somebody's making $120,000 a year, uh, you don't get to pay them $10,000 a month by going three months and, and using 12 weeks. It's, it's only going to be proportional uh, to, to what they have. I, I think I'll make sure Steve uh, agrees with me on that one. But, but I think that's one of those deals where don't go above in your representations on somebody that's making the 100000 That's a hard cap on compensation. Steve, you want to comment on that one? Yes, I, I, I agree. That, that, that's, the, that's the way to go, uh, way to go through it. And, and as long as you're consistent from the, uh, the initial application for the PPP loan forgiveness all the way through um, your, your, your forgiveness product, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, fine showing what you did. What we're looking at is to make sure people are, are comparing apples to apples and yeah, definitely being proportional to the, the cover period. That next question is great. I wonder, Mark, if you want to tackle the, the next question. Um, this is about the... Uh, I've not yet opened my business. Yeah. Uh, so... And by the way, can everybody see the questions in the q and I believe so. Is okay, great. I thought that was a really interesting question and one that's pertinent. Mm -hmm. So it's it's still for the coverage period. So five months of rent, you know, um, it, it, it that gets into the was the rent that you're paying related to the coverage period of the 24 weeks. Um, so you can essentially pay 24 weeks of rent uh, with some um, ability on the, you know, to to calculate it. I mean, that's how I would answer it was it's, uh, you're going to essentially start by paying 24 weeks of rent uh, so that it's incurred uh, rent payment. So there could be a little room there um, on the normal payment date of, uh, to include a little bit more than that. But um, 
I'm not really answering that really well. Maybe it's, well, I'm getting it, tired of as this webinar is going on. <laughs> let me let me let me frame it a little bit differently. So basically, what they're saying is they're going to pay 16 weeks of rent, but only up to 12 weeks of payroll. And in the 40-60 uh, uh, mix, is that still okay? So so I think yeah, if the 40-60 mix is still a, if, if you hit that 60% threshold, then the rest can be used on rent. Correct. And e even if they're that. mismatched periods, right? That's what I think that's the question. 16 weeks of rent, 12 weeks of payroll. If you're 60, 40, are you still fine? Steve, anything you see there that, that tells us we're not fine? That's, that's going to be another question I, I, I got to make because that, that's a good one. Um, yeah. from, from what I hear, I think they're going to want to see consistency. So basically, if you're prorating A, then uh, B, C, and D need to be prorated as well at the same, um, uh, you, you basically using the same same covered periods there. But let me let me push that up. If you can look at uh, doing, well, uh, like you said, a, a well, different payroll I don't think, period. Yeah. I think the the coverage period is going to be the same regardless. Yeah. It's just that at, it'll be most of the payroll will be towards the end of the coverage period if you were to look at the reports, but it would still all equal the coverage, the line one payroll costs would be for the entire coverage period. You're not saying you're splitting it out. It's just that um, this business is, is not open. It can't open yet. Um, and so it, it's payroll is, 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 is next to nothing at this point in time. Um, but the payroll will still fall within the coverage period. I wouldn't have any qualms about that. Um, and Brad's, sounds like he's agreeing with me on that. So. Yeah, I think all three of these questions that go back to the paid and the incurred, and as long as you're covering costs that are paid and incurred during your period, and for forgiveness, you're meeting the 60% test, uh, to me, that all seems okay. So, because it's very similar to a restaurant that got closed by government, and so they have no payroll, but they got to continue paying rent, They'd be, even though they're not a new business, they'd fall into the same category. They'd have rent payments while they didn't have any payroll, but as long as they met that 60% threshold by the end of the covered period, I think it'd be just fine. And then the, the next, that was a great question though. And, and let's make sure we let Steve follow up on the, I'm, I'm hearing the logic from everybody, but the proportionality issue versus an odd max of pay rent for more months than you do. It makes sense. And the second question, the, the, the question from uh, Johnny is actually a good one too. Uh, we've had businesses that closed at the beginning of the period and simply chose to pay their employees for eight weeks uh, and, and rent and to give themselves time. One that's probably not gonna reopen. Uh, I'm assuming, Steve, that as long as uh, the payroll is covered for eight weeks and the ratio of 75 percent to uh the original 75 25 or now the new updated 60 uh 40 is met that we're fine that, that that even though they may have been closed ultimately may close permanently as long as they maintain the payment rate to the employees and can document it in the covered period they should be forgiven yes yes that that meets the criteria and, and the intent that'd be fine yes and I think this answers the Johnny Girona question directly as well. Can you close for the office? You can keep paying employees uh, forgiveness even if the business is closed. And so the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. All right. A couple more questions, it looks like. Um, and we also do have one in the chat, I think, um, to clarify between um, bi weekly and semi monthly um, and using the alternative covered period in that regard so well the alternative coverage period is bi-weekly or more frequent so if you pay twice a month that is considered semi-monthly and um, so that would not you would not be able to use the alternative coverage period to adjust your payroll to start um, or your coverage period to start with your pay periods only that only applies to the every two weeks uh, bi-weekly and the weekly. Um, but if you have a 24 week period, you should have more yeah. room there. What I would start with if, they, if they're, um, 
that would be my assumption would be to jump over to the 24 and try to get it done that way. If you're going to stick to the eight, then you, you're going to, um, depending on how conservative or aggressive you want to be on that paid and incurred, then you would either try to include all the ones that were paid uh, by check date in, in that uh, coverage period or end up trying to prorate on the front and back end. Uh, depending if you, you want to be more conservative or uh, how you work with your lender on that. Uh, one question on here, I, I feel like we may have answered this in a prior webinar, but I just would love to hear it again. Uh, a lot of people, in their if it's spelled out in their lease, that the part of the lease agreement is, you know, these triple net leases and things like that, but also some of these leases include that the the that they must make the HOA payments uh, as part of their rent provision. So I'm assuming that would be considered she's the questioner here says utilities but would that be considered under the rent if it's spelled out in the lease yes that would that would be included and and, and mm. honestly for for a fee like that there's sort of uh what do you want to say outside uh you can include that in, i think uh in either uh, the rent category or the utility category but either way it's fine hoa yeah, and then yeah. the the final question on here um, that we have is regarding internet access. Internet access is considered a utility, correct, everyone? Yes. Uh, now the question here is: This happens to be a lodging hotel, and they have some additional monitoring. Uh, you know what that entails or not? That that would be taking it another step, and is the monitoring, uh, you know. I don't know if it's a bundled thing or not bundled thing, but, or is that a, a, you know, you know, considered a utility cost for that lodger? Right. Well, one easy way to look at it to help folks filter is if they normally include this on uh, working or uh, general business expenses when they file their taxes, if, if, if it's included as an expense that they routinely report, then it's going to, to be included, um, on on the the PPP forgiveness non non payable part said so that's that's a definite win. Uh, when the expense hasn't been included or filed before, that's that's when you sort of have to ask the question. If that helps uh, with clarification. Uh, Mark, I've, I've got a question, not necessarily on that subject, but um, this may be for Jessica or Brad. I'm not quite sure, but for Schedule C filers. Uh, what I, I know what the original loan was calculated on. It was based on Schedule C, their uh, basically their net income for the a, a two and a half a month period. What what are you seeing as far as forgiveness documentation for the forgiveness uh, of those amounts? Are, are, are you asking what is needed to document it, or are you asking what is qualified for forgiveness, or both? Well, I, I guess I, I guess both, uh, because <laughs> if Jessica's the lender, and somebody on you know they got a four five thousand dollar loan based on their Schedule C for two thousand and nineteen, and yet they haven't done a Schedule C for twenty. Twenty yet, they don't know what their income is going to be. What what do they submit in order for forgiveness of that five thousand dollar loan? Alex, anybody? Jess, Jess, yeah. Uh, so I and and I think that this this will vary a bit, but I think our initial read on it has been, or at least what we've been advocating to clients is try and take a draw earlier, uh, you know, quarterly so that there is some sort of uh, documentation of you paying yourself. So we definitely have some customers who do annual draws, and that was one of the problems coming into the season, uh, coming into the, the, uh, the program, the PPP program, was uh, they weren't exactly sure how exactly they needed to document it. So what we've encouraged people is, if you're in that kind of situation where you, you technically get paid once a year or you take a draw, 
uh, you want to try and prorate it as much as you can to be able to demonstrate that. And so those bank statements uh, are the things that you would probably use. Um, that'd be my kind of quick read. Brad, I don't know if there's other ways that you've seen folks do it. Yeah, and again, I think it, it all goes back to you know how they what they qualified for their loan, which was based on um, I think line 31 or 32 of their Schedule C. I think it's the same thing here. And I'm looking. I'm actually looking at the instructions for the application. And so, you know, the amount that they can pay themselves again is capped at the lesser of either the the fifteen thousand three hundred and eighty five or the twenty thousand eight hundred thirty three, depending on whether they're using eight weeks or twenty four weeks. So the lesser of those two amounts, and the equivalent of their two thousand nineteen Schedule C line thirty one net self employment earnings. So even though they're paying themselves in 2020, I think it's still driven off of, at least my interpretation, off of that original language, which is still in the instructions for the forgiveness application. And so they pay themselves whatever that amount is, it's paid as a draw, just like it normally would be if it's a Schedule C. And I, I, I think the only way to document that, I think, is, is bank records and, um, and whatnot. Uh, qu quick process check. Tracy, do you know how many people are still on the call? We have 48. 48. So uh, we don't have any current questions from the group. Would, would, would some of you on the chat let us know if we've uh, adequately met uh, uh, what you want us to talk about? I think the only open question I see is, uh, uh, well, I'm not positive, but, but timing-wise, for the EZ form would buy monthly pays on 15th and last day of the month or for the bi-weekly coverage period. I think we have a, I mean, we may have answered that earlier. I don't know when that was, was stated, but that's the we only answer that. We answered that. Okay. Yeah. Um, we did have uh, a couple, um, just a pre-submitted questions that we didn't address and they're pretty basic um, regarding the forgiveness application. So one person asked, may I still use the original forgiveness application for my eight weeks covered period, the funds were used within eight weeks and I've already done the work and filled out the original form. The answer is yes, but we're not gonna give you extra credit on the test. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then the other question is, now I am eligible for the easy form, am I, only, am I required to use it or can I still use the non-easy form? Man, I would, Wow, uh, this is yeah, advising, that's, that's but I mean, I, I don't know why you wouldn't, I don't know why you wouldn't use the easy form from a, uh, just because it reduces your error. You know, uh, you could have an error on the longer form. It was, it, it was hard for everyone on this call, I think. So uh, <laughs> I would take a second look at that easy form just because uh, your likelihood of an error has to have been reduced if you use the two page easy form. And then, yes, it doesn't look like there's any additional. Oh, here, someone has, um, Steve asked another question. Um, so uh, he's just clarifying his previous question. So he's not con concerned about consuming PPP funds, the FTE, um, to wait until a date we can get the best FTE level to choose the end of our covered period, correct? And I would say, I would say yes, to wait until you meet those requirements. This was getting back to the question that Steve addressed that um, kind of piqued Brad and I's interest there a little bit for a couple different reasons. Um, you know, because I was under when the Flexibility Act came out, I was that was a question I had. Are they going to make you keep your FTE levels for 24 weeks, or are they are you going to be okay with uh, you know reducing staff hours or making staffing changes after the funds have been exhausted? Um, you know, if it becomes before the 24 weeks. Um, and I'm assuming uh, this borrower cannot uh, justify uh, being impacted by the safe harbor uh, in their business. And, and yeah. if, so they have to, they have to prove your FTEs here. So, um, yeah, it, so in this case, you're going to have, unless some more guidance comes out for Treasury or maybe Steve wants to readdress that question. Um, 
but Steve made it sound like if you're exhausted the funds at 15 weeks or whatever it is, submit your application. Once your application has been submitted, that the SBA is not going to hold you to anything after your, S- your application has been submitted. Um, so. Yeah, that, that, that's my understanding at this time. That's what uh, came from higher uh, from us. So that's, that's why we're giving that guidance. Basically, once you meet the 100, apply. Because um, we don't know that you're going to be held to that. Uh, like I said, I'm going to uh, fish that one back up through the chain and, and hopefully get uh, an answer I can send out in writing that um, can be used um, by by everyone on, on the call. But that's my understanding at, at this point. Thank you, Steve. I was just trying to share a link. Um, Michael was asking about the um, specific, uh, I can't say that, attestation language. The, the attestation, yeah. that's a weird word. Um, if that's included in the legislation. And Brad just sent me the link to the, um, to the bill and I tried to copy and paste it to send to Michael and that didn't work. Um, but we will be sure, I will share that with you. Um, I forgot that copy and pasting does it really? Yeah. And again, I would just be careful about relying on any language in a bill that has not passed yet, because yeah, who so. knows what's going to happen between the house and the Senate. Um, so it, I provided the, the link, uh, but again, we don't know if it's even going to become law and what that law will look like if it does yeah. become law. Yeah. Um, and then Steve says, you know, technically, and you know, they have until, um, December 31st to prove or to settle any reductions in FTE. So, you know, going back to, do you wait until the 31st till you meet that? Or can you apply in advance for forgiveness? So it's not like Steve says, yes, you can still apply in advance for forgiveness. Um, and if you, you know, you'll meet those um, safe harbor requirements. Yeah, there, there's still some tough decisions where, where we, we think a lot of people will be covered under these safe harbors, but there, there's still going to be some people that have some um, gray areas to sort out, it sounds like, in certain scenarios. All right. And um, numbers are dropping. So we're down to 39 people. Um, and wow, it's 337. So um, if, any last, last call for questions? <laughs> and um, as mentioned earlier, we will be sending out um, a link to the recording and link to the resources. And you know, some of the things we did have someone, you know, was asking, um, you know, some more guidance about you know, language and terms, definitions used in the forms. Um, we did address that in a previous webinar. So I'll be sure that I maybe include links to those as well. Um, so you guys can reference back to some of those things. And um, gosh, thank you everybody. And <laughs> Oh, any update on, oh, good one. Any update on deductibility of expenses paid and forgiven? Brad. Thanks, Otto. <laughs> Appreciate that, Otto. No, there is no update. Uh, the, uh, the AICPA is still pushing, um, I believe, pushing Congress to, to backpedal on that, but there's been no update on that as far as I know. Um, again, it was not the original intent, Congress's intent, that um, those expenses would not be deductible. So I would hope to see something, but as of today, I don't know of anything unless anybody else on the call knows of something with regard to that. No, I. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone again for your time. And uh, we will continue to monitor these bills and be sure to um, keep our clients and subscribers apprised of any updates. And, um, you know, we're here to help answer questions the best that we're able. And I think, you know, just to reiterate everything that was discussed today, you know, it's just important to, you know, not rush into the forgiveness process, application process. You know, definitely wait until your lender is ready and wait until you've spent your funds so that you know you can meet those requirements. Um, I think you know, Mark has you know, great insights of you know, maybe try filling out that um, easy form yourself just to get a feel for things. And um, if there are things that are just still unclear to you, reach out to your lender or your CPA or 
um, business advisor for you know clarification and guidance and um, you know, spend as much as possible. I think you know I think a lot of people just from my perspective are kind of getting hung up on some items like does this count or does that count? I think now that you have your 24 weeks um, that you can really stick to things that you know are definitely outlining guidance that count as eligible expenses. So I suggest you know, focusing on those items. And then if you still have funds to spare <laughs> and then maybe look into some of those other items. I mean, I thought Alexander's advice, use it all on payroll costs. That's the best way to achieve forgiveness, um, especially since that was the intent of the law. And essentially you have 24 weeks now to um, spend 8.5 or I'm sorry, two, two and a half months worth of payroll costs. So I think, um, you know, you should be able to, to meet that. And, you know, now you have time to get through the documentation and review the, um, the applications and, and then ask those specific questions if you need clarification. Well, thank you, Tracy, for putting this together. Brad, for jumping on with us and helping out. Uh, Doug, Alex, uh, with the bank. Um, it's, uh, it's the end of the road, hopefully, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone stay safe. Uh, it's uh, we still got the summer to get through. So, right. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys, for putting this together. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, everyone. Well done, Tracy. Bye bye. Bye, everybody.